So let me make sure I got this straight. Hey, wait, where's Tweedledee and Tweedledum? Oh, so you didn't hear? They've both been moved to oversee Destiny's expanded media universe. Here, read this. Bungie appointed Mark Noseworthy, Vice President, Destiny Universe, and Luke Smith, Executive Creative Director, Destiny Universe, to oversee and prepare for the expansion of the Destiny Universe into additional media. Justin Truman, General Manager, Destiny 2, takes over the successful development leadership of Destiny 2. Wait, 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 wait hold the fun bus back the fuck up. <laughs> so, what you're saying is, Luke Smith and Mark Noseworthy got sunset? Well, I wouldn't put it that way. No, 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 think about it, hear me out. They're still at the company, I mean, just like my guns are still in the game. And sure, they could be used for things concerning the game, but they're just, they're simply not meta anymore. Now this Justin Truman guy is the new hot fresh meta. Well, <laughs> that's just, that's just beautiful. <sighs> Looks like I'm gonna have to find another bit. Eh, fuck it. One more for old time's sake. Uh -huh. What's going on ladies and gents, boys and girls, guardians of all ages, Joker back again, once again, and for years now, brainless Destiny 2 fanboys have had the audacity to call me a Destiny 2 hater, because I have spent a fair amount of time reacting to the various current states of Destiny 2, and it would not be an understatement to say that Destiny 2 has spent more time bad than it has good. However, even when it's bad, I always make sure to give credit where credit is due, something these people are all too ready to forget or outright ignore simply because it doesn't suit their narrative. I think for most part, these reactionary fanboys are small-minded. They could not foresee a version of Destiny that was better than what we have now. They were myopic in their vision, much like Luke Smith was myopic in his vision for the franchise. Well, ladies and gents, boys and girls, guardians of all ages, I am, dare I say, ecstatic. To not only prove all these narrow-minded fanboys wrong, but to see Destiny begin to develop under the leadership of its new game director, Justin Truman, and new assistant game director, Joe Blackburn, that seems to, and only time will tell, be everything I knew the game could be, if put in the hands of the right people. Oh, do the thing! Seriously, watch this. The outline for the future of Destiny is brought to us courtesy of the new assistant game director, Joe Blackburn, a 9-page, 3,640-word state-of-the-game blog post that suspiciously reads like somebody has been a fan of my channel for a long time. Or, you know, written by somebody who has some basic common sense? But hey, whose details and why are we fucking them? Now, before we get into it, I just want to preface all of this with a We should be very, very cautiously optimistic. As the saying goes, words are wind. But I would also be lying if I said I wasn't grinning ear to ear while reading this. As I stated earlier, and I assume, as longtime fans will note, there are a lot of changes here that I have been asking for since the release of Destiny 2. But enough preamble, this is a long article, so let's dive right in. I'm of course going to skip right over the my life story part of the article, as wholesome as that is, because, well, there's a lot to read, so let's just get to the meat and potatoes. Witch Queen, Lightfall, and beyond. Last summer, we outlined our ambition for the next era of Destiny 2 by announcing the full arc, starting with Beyond Light, followed by Witch Queen and Lightfall. As we began to scale production on Witch Queen last year, we made the difficult but important decision to move its release to early 2022. We also realized we needed to add an additional unannounced chapter after Lightfall to fully complete our first saga of Destiny. Alright, alright, so it looks like Destiny has three more expansions now, not just two. It was kind of assumed, given the title Lightfall, 
and the relation of its release to Bungie's wish to have a new IP release in 2025, that Lightfall would be the last hurrah for Destiny. I'm glad it's not. What they're proposing here sounds an awful lot like what Final Fantasy XIV is doing with their next expansion, where it'll be the end of the Zodiac saga that started with the release of Final Fantasy XIV. So it's going to be interesting to see where Bungie goes with the Destiny universe, because from the bottom up, the Destiny universe, from development to the actual creation story of the Destiny universe within the Destiny universe, as told to us in the Book of the Unveiling, was founded on the schism between the light and the darkness. Now, I've always said that Destiny doesn't end with us just going in and dicking down the darkness and everybody living happily ever after. Sure, there will probably be at some point some raid boss avatar of the darkness that we fight. But the true victory between light and darkness will be one where the two rival forms of ruin have been brought back in balance. This, of course, leaves us wondering, what's next? What do you do after you solve the schism between the light and the darkness? Well, while we likely have a while before we see the seeds of that plotline, I'd like to remind people that the Vex are the most dangerous enemy race in all of Destiny. Sure, we laugh at the big, dumb, salty robots, but their penultimate goal is to write themselves into existence as a fundamental law. In Destiny 1, we didn't really have a grasp on what that meant or what that would entail. However, after Shadowkeep and the Book of the Unveiling, we do. The light and the darkness are entities that have existed before existence, and it is by their design that existence exists. The Vex want to ascend to be a third variable like the light and the darkness. You'll also note that we have Witch Queen, so the Hive. We have Lightfall, which has a pyramid ship. Where's the Vex expansion? The Vex are ultimately something that we're going to have to deal with. Hmm. But back to the article. We've long thought about moving Destiny's annual release to the early half of the year, primarily for the health of the team. But with Witch Queen, and not being tied to legacy expansions, allowed us to make this choice early. Yes, absolutely fan-fucking-tastic, you love to see it. So, this is something I've talked about several times, not just with annual releases, but more specifically, season pass content. One second Luke Smith in his state of the game is like, Oh yes, the season pass content is untenable and hurts the well-being of our employees. The next he's like, Let's triple down on it! Even if it hurts the well-being of our employees. Like, Nani the fuck? And mind you, the first time he said that the season pass was untenable, Bungie, during that development cycle, had the help of Vicarious Visions and High Moon Studios. If it was untenable then, it was most certainly going to be untenable without them. And you have to imagine that this does have a knock-on effect to the size and quality of the larger expansions. Now this might not necessarily change the stress in the immediate for the development teams, but Let's say Witch Queen comes out in mid to late February 2022. That's an extra, what, four to five months of development, depending on certification and testing and stuff like that, on a main DLC that should, in theory, on paper, have a knock-on effect for the seasons going forward. Meaning, unless there's only one team developing Destiny DLC, those seasons and the next DLC, Lightfall, should also have a lot of dev time as well. So while I expect that this year and the seasons therein will be sort of light on content, I do suspect it'll be heavy on tweaks and system changes and game mode changes, things that the game needs now, in order to allow the leadership, which seems to have a vision, to set down a foundation moving forward that allows them to create a backlog of content on the developer side that isn't subject to an ever-shifting game state. So I do hope for the sake of the game, the sake of the staff, the sake of the community, Bungie really does, moving forward, take seriously the idea of having a content buffer. The Witch Queen represents an important evolution in the ongoing story of Destiny 2. Beyond Light built the foundation and allowed us to weave the world building of Destiny and Destiny 2 together. But the Witch Queen will light the fire on a strongly interconnected narrative across the Lightfall and beyond, unlike anything we've ever attempted before, with characters, arcs, heroes, and villains that persist over multiple future releases. Even more importantly, the conclusion of these releases will also conclude the Light and Darkness saga. 
the conflict we introduced with the launch of Destiny many years ago. As we began developing The Witch Queen, we realized that we needed this release to be the first of many moments critical to the story of Destiny. With so much leading to and dependent on what happens in The Witch Queen, we wanted to make sure that we gave ourselves enough time to build out this journey in the right way, starting with an exceptional first chapter in The Witch Queen. First, can I say that I absolutely love how Joe Blackburn is taking ownership of where he truly believes we'll begin to see the shakeup in leadership when it comes to Destiny 2's development. What do I mean? Well, the only DLC he has promised will be good is The Witch Queen, not the remaining Season Pass content, which sort of makes sense, as the wheels for that have likely been in motion for a while. That doesn't mean they won't be good. They could be good. We don't know, right? We won't know until we know. But to butcher a skill-up reference, ships and stopping. However, what he is promising is one, ownership over the Witch Queen. Good, bad, indifferent, that's on new management, not anyone else. And two, as we'll see throughout this article, he's promising actionable quality of life changes over the next couple of seasons. Things that, even if the season pass content was already in development, can be tacked onto them to improve the quality of the game. Second, there is no reason at this point, honestly, that Bungie shouldn't have the narrative of Destiny on paper finish, even if it's just the broad strokes. While the lore of the Destiny universe tends to do the heavy lifting, the in-game storytelling has never been that cerebral. They should, theoretically speaking, know where the story is going and how it all ends. And it does seem like they've done just that. So again, I applaud their foresight. I also applaud their vision and the delay of Witch Queen to make sure it's the best that it can be, all while laying down the foundation through quality of life changes to usher in the future of Destiny. Does all of this remain to be seen? Will it all pan out? Who knows? But hey, benefit of the doubt, right? At least they are saying the right things. They have a vision, they have a plan. Now, all they need to do is deliver on it. But moving forward, with Destiny now committed to being an everlasting, evolving world, wait, it wasn't committed before? We want to make sure we are still taking the time to upgrade the systematic foundation of Destiny 2 to support everything we want to do in the future. Our ultimate vision for Destiny 2 still stands, a definitive action MMO, a unified global community where you can play Destiny anywhere with your friends. For 2021, this means upgrading our approach to keeping Destiny's weapons and armor game fresh, finding our vision for PvP, implementing transmog, and adding crossplay. More below. Again, exactly what I was just saying. This year needs to be about the quality of life of Destiny, improving the leveling, PvP, transmog's growing pains, which it inevitably will have, just like any cosmetic system that people are looking forward to that just so happens to be tied to the gas shop. Yay! And growing pains with crossplay. Get that all out of the way now and build a destiny where, instead of wasting time to add new systems or overhaul armor and weapon systems, they can do things like, I don't know, worry about PvP balance or, I don't know, um, you know, maybe this thing called tell great stories with interesting and diverse gameplay mechanics? I know, a novel concept. Rewards that matter aka sunsetting sunsetting. With season 11, we introduced Infusion Caps, an iteration on the infusion system designed to keep Destiny's gear game fresh from release to release and create a healthy ecosystem for our aspirational content. While we still believe in these goals, it is clear that our execution was off the mark. <laughs> you can most certainly say that again. Infusion Caps helped us meaningfully shift the meta in Beyond Light and create a reward ecosystem that was manageable to balance and monitor. Did it though? Did it though? Did it though? I mean, let's be real, let's be honest, let's be real honest. Let's use an example here. Bungie took Mindbenders away, and people went to Fellwinners, people went to Astral Horizon. So, basically, same shit different day. Bungie Sunset Revoker and Beloved, and now we have Adored, Frozen Orbit, Eye of Soul. Again, same shit, different day. The only thing that shifted was the name of the weapons. And with that in mind, was it really worth taking away Mindbender's Ambition or Beloved? Weapons that people spent days and weeks, if not years, farming for? No. 
And this is something that a lot of people who like to bitch about getting killed by the same weapon over and over and over and over and over again in PvP are just gonna have to get the fuck over. Oh, a rose by any other name smells as sweet. Yeah, bitch, it's Astral Horizon, it's Fellwinners, it's Mindbenders, it's Eye of Soul, it's Frozen Orbit, it's Adored, it's all the same shit, different day. That's just how it is. This idea that hundreds of weapons with hundreds of perks can be perfectly balanced so everything is viable at all times is a pipe dream. The best we will ever get is what I call competitive balance, where the game is balanced more to cater to a skill gap. However, I digress and the article continues, but the system has made our rewards feel like they have an expiration date and have frequently made playing our legacy content feel shallow. We want the rewards that you earn in Beyond Light and subsequent seasons to feel like valuable tools you can use in the incredible challenges you'll face in Witch Queen. So we're making a change. So we're going to get into it in a moment, but this is absolutely positively a finger on the pulse of the community right here. Gasp, shock, horror, lightning crackle, lightning crackle, lightning crackle. Looks like somebody at Bungie was actually hearing and comprehending what the community was saying and not just listening. Like I said, gasp, shock, Horror! Lightning crackle, lightning crackle, why is this surprising? This is what a game developer should be doing! But hey, whose details and why are we fucking them? I mean, it's really easy to break down just how bad sunsetting is. Think about it. Just since the start of Season of Chosen, before the announcement that sunsetting was being sunset was announced, how many weapons did you get? And you're like, yeah, that would have been cool like, I don't know, half a year ago. But now when it's about to expire, it's utterly pointless, so dismantled. I think we've all been there once or twice since sunsetting was introduced. But moving forward, we've made the decision that any weapons or armor that can currently be infused to max power will continue to be able to reach max power permanently. Starting in Season 14, we won't be capping the infusion on any weapons or armor that have not already reached the cap as of the start of Season 13. That means you'll be able to take your trusty, your fallen guillotine, and all the high-statted armor you've earned this year to take on the raid in the Witch Queen. While we still strongly believe that Destiny needs a method to shift our meta in the game's most challenging activities, we don't believe that infusion caps are the right answer. We're taking time this year to research and validate a plan to create a fresh and balanced ecosystem for our most aspirational content. One that doesn't make our rewards feel like they have an expiration date. We've learned a lot this year and don't want to rush into finding the best plan. So don't expect to hear anything more about this until after the Witch Queen. Because we won't be capping any more of our weapons, we must consider more variables in the game's balance of our upcoming seasons and releases. So expect to see some tuning when it comes to our biggest outliers in PvP and PvE. Yes, I'm looking at you, Fell Winners, and Warmind Cells. This is a big change for Destiny, and one that we did not make lightly. However, we believe there is nothing more important in Destiny than getting our rewards right. So in my opinion, one of the ways that you go about creating challenging gameplay in the most aspirational content is through a give and take of weapon balance and game design. What do I mean? Well, on a micro level, we might ask, why does snipers and hand cannons, or anything for that matter, have, I don't know, 100 aim assist? Like, that just seems ludicrous. You want to shift the meta in, like, say, PvP? Make things harder to use. If you want to shift the meta in PvE, reevaluate how your encounters are designed. If I have to fight a flying boss, Lament isn't going to do me a whole hell of a lot of good. Menagerie also did this fantastically, at least on a conceptual level as more of the encounters were about completing objectives than they were overpowering mobs of enemies. And that's where the balance lies. Sure, you don't want people using Whisper of Worm with infinite ammo to melt bosses. But also, why did you make Whisper of the Worm with infinite ammo to melt bosses? Sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy when they inevitably had to go in and nerf it. And again, that's just on the micro level. On the macro level, it starts with looking at the design of something like, say, Whisper of the Worm, or more notoriously, Stasis, and going, what is the nightmare scenario for this? And then designing accordingly, in the hopes that, worst case scenario, your dev time will be spent buffing something, not nerfing something that will run wild through the game for the better part of a year before you get around to being able to do anything about it. But moving forward. Now that we've talked about rewards, let's talk about power. Last year, we started a paradigm where we raised the overall power cap by 50 each season. While this helped to ensure that the infusion cap shifted the meta, it also made it so each season felt like a significant reset the power 
you had accumulated. To combat this, we will be experimenting with a new power level cap. Starting in Season 14, we will only be raising the power cap by 10 for each non-expansion season. This means if you reach the maximum power in Season 13, when next season rolls around, you will be directly in the 10 point pinnacle band of the power pursuit. This power increase should feel familiar to anybody who played Season of the Dawn last year, and we're excited to see how this progression feels alongside our new systems. We believe that this change will make it easier to pick up and enjoy Destiny each season, while still allowing us to have a deep RPG power pursuit when we launch the Witch Queen. You know what? You gotta respect it. I have been saying for a long time now, leveling is not content. And in all honesty, I really don't think that's going to change here either. I think they've just narrowed the grind down without much rhyme or reason to why we're leveling in the first place and what levels actually mean in Destiny. If the only reason you have levels is because it's an RPG and you need numbers to go up to show progress, maybe you should rethink how progress works in your game. Angels of Death. Like many of you, I am passionate about PvP. In Destiny 2, it is clear that we haven't had a consistent message around these modes. So, I'd like to share our high-end level vision for the Crucible. Direct player versus player competition is essential in Destiny as an option to express mastery over your Guardian and showcase the strength of your arsenal against other players. It's a simple vision, but it's one that is critical to making the game feel like a real place for those players that crave that showcase where the rewards you've earned, the skills you've demonstrated, and how you've built your Guardian all matter. So, let's talk about what we're doing this year for PvP, starting with our two priorities, improving gameplay sandbox balance in the Crucible, and upgrading the experience of our most aspirational game modes. Bravo, bravo, bravo. This is something that a lot of people don't quite understand, more so the But Joker, just remove PvP from the game! Folks, without PvP, Destiny would not have survived as long as it has. And we know that because unlike proper MMOs like Final Fantasy XIV, Destiny just simply doesn't have the breadth of PvE content required to sustain its longevity. This is why it needs both a healthy PvE and PvP mode. It is and will always be the marriage of these two modes that sustains Destiny and makes it unique amongst its competition. When it comes to balance updates, these can be divided into three major brackets. First, in Season 15, we will be addressing 3-peaking in Trials and Competitive. In these modes, emotes will be disabled and players will be unable to pull out any third-person weapon that doesn't have ammo. Third-person experiences are part of what makes Destiny's gameplay feel so good, but it was clear in our most competitive arenas that these mechanics were being used in ways we did not intend. This is a tricky problem to solve in Destiny's complicated sandbox, but we think this is a good starting point. Second. Over the next several seasons, we will be making changes to stasis and light-based subclasses in order to achieve a healthier balance of subclasses in the Crucible. Across Season 13 and 14, we will be adjusting stasis in the Crucible in order to bring its overall effectiveness in line with our light-based subclasses. Here's some of the changes you can expect coming to updates this season and next. Behemoth Titan Decrease Super Damage Reduction Increase Super Energy Cost when performing a light attack Remove Freeze AoE on Supercast. Thank fucking god! Reduced traveling efficiency of Shiver Strike when slowed. Revenant Hunter. Decreased Withering Blade's damage in tracking. Decreased slowed stacks applied to targets. Remove Shatter Dive's damage reduction. Shadebinder Warlock. Fix bug where Ice Flare Bolts won't track towards targets immediately on creation. Fix bug where Shadebinder Super Projectiles were not tracking until a certain distance traveled. Decrease Crystal Shatter Damage For Season 15, we are also looking at universal adjustments to stasis by increasing damage reduction when frozen to provide more survivability for the victim. While you're at it, can you like remove the half a dozen debuffs you get when slowed? Because that would be great. Following the stasis tuning in Season 15, we will also focus on light subclasses and release a set of targeted buffs to our most underutilized specializations. The goal of these changes is to keep stasis feeling great in PvE and to bring its representation in PvP more in line with our light-based abilities. Finally, we want to continue to adjust weapon archetype performance and introduce new perks that shift the meta in the Crucible. 
I think the team has done a great job in this area over the last several months, introducing balance changes both at the seasonal boundaries and at the mid-season. And we want to continue to drive down this path to diversify the types of loadouts you encounter from season to season. In addition, at season 15, we will also be looking to adjust overall ability usage rates to make sure guns and gun play are always the key to success in the Crucible. Now this is somewhat of a bitter pill to swallow, only in the fact that it's going to take like the better part of half a year to resolve every item on this list. But at the same time, hey, every item on this list is fucking amazing. And don't get me wrong, I completely understand that this is going to take some time. To butcher skill up reference again, something about boats and stopping. More so when the command staff of that boat has been changed. And I guess this does kind of confirm our fear that we all sort of had about stasis. That they did look at stasis during development, said it was fine, and shipped it. And now they're wasting even more dev time to kind of reimagine what stasis should actually actually be like now that it's out in the sandbox and running rampant. That said, live and learn, just as long as this doesn't happen again in Witch Queen, it's whatever. Honestly, TBH high and low. And now we get into a couple of stretches of longer bunchy dialogue where I really don't have that much to add, so please bear with me. Of course, gameplay balance only matters when the underlying playing field is fair, and unfortunately, cheating continues to be a significant issue, especially on PC. We're always working to maintain security as new exploits emerge. And, as always, we don't want to talk a lot about those improvements for fear of empowering the bad guys. A few areas we can talk about are, we are aiming to nearly double the size of Bungie's game security team this year, reflecting our long-term commitment to fair play. We've begun regular surveys to better understand your experiences with cheating and to measure our progress. This new data enriches our existing systems from player reports. Thank you for reporting. And game instrumentation. If you receive one of these surveys, please share your experiences to help us fight cheating. We've begun a strategy of aggressive legal action against cheat developers. You may have seen news articles about some of our early actions here, and we will continue to pursue those who undermine fair play using every tool at our disposal, both in partnerships with other studios and under our own flag. We will share more security news when we can. That's great, love to hear it. Beyond gameplay balance and security, we want to adjust the structure of our most aspirational PvP modes in order to make them a better experience for our players. First up, we're targeting an overhaul of the Trials of Osiris reward structure and matchmaking paradigms to release before the end of this year. With this update, we specifically want to target a few things. Improve the overall health of Trials matchmaking pool by incentivizing a wider audience to engage and better defining separation of skill tiers. I hope by defining skill tiers, they don't mean skill-based matchmaking because that would actually be a disaster for trials. And before somebody starts furiously typing away in the comments, big joker, no, 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 let me explain. Skill-based matchmaking is quite possibly one of the easiest systems in Destiny or in gaming to actually manipulate. Just spend some time tanking your true skill and it's easy matches to the lighthouse. Or do what they did in Halo 3 with ranked called boosting, where players would go in, they would tank their account so their ELO and true skill or whatever was so low it was pathetic, and they would provide boosting services where you could pay them and they would help you get to rank 50, or in this case, get to the lighthouse, because all you'd ever be playing is easy people. On top of that, recovery services aren't going to go anywhere. And the people using recovery services aren't the best of the best, they aren't the cream of the cream pie. They're the worst of the worst no offense. So now we have a built-in way for them to guarantee that all they'll ever do is play bad players. Again, see skill tanking. That's not to say that the current system is perfect either. It has a lot of issues, but going to a vastly more exploitable system is not the answer. So I hope Bungie comes up with something new for Trials. Rebuild the Trials reward structure so that it encourages more players to stick to their active cards longer. Our current structure encourages a lot of recycling cards after a single loss, meaning the first game of your Trials card has a high chance of being incredibly challenging. We want to build a reward structure that continually pushes higher skilled players to want to progress deeper into their card even after a loss, making 3-5 wins a more achievable goal for more players. Investigate opportunities for solo players to participate in Trials regularly. We believe that this will not only make the matchmaking pools healthier, but will also encourage more players to see what Trials is all about, and hopefully form social connections with other PvP-loving guardians. 
After Trials, we will be targeting a similar scope refresh to Iron Banner. While there is a lot to do when it comes to supporting the Crucible, we want to target our efforts around global PvP balance and our most aspirational modes first. That all sounds really great, we just need to see how it pans out. For example, if they add skill-based matchmaking to Trials, um, I'm gonna abuse the fuck out of it, and I'm gonna make videos about how to abuse the fuck out of it. Like, done. Easy. No, seriously. Like, really. TBH, high and low, all day, er day. If you have an easy system to abuse, and you can abuse it to get easy matches, why would you not do that? Work smart, not hard. Outside of that, I'm really interested to see what their plan is to get solo players into Trials, because communication is a huge thing. I could see them possibly implementing a freelance playlist, but at that point it's just RNG based on your team, and that splits up the Trials population. So it would be rather counterintuitive to a healthy Trials population. Another thing I could see them doing, and maybe this would actually help the Trials population, is until the first three wins of your card, you are put into a general population matchmaking pool. After three wins, you have to have a team. And maybe somewhere along the line of those three wins, you actually form a team. So, there you go. Praetis Revenge. In Season 14, the Vault of Glass will return. The team will have a lot more to say about it before launch, but there are a few things I'd like to clarify now. Our philosophy on bringing things out of the Destiny Content Vault is to keep them feeling like the content you remember while updating them to meet Destiny 2 difficulty and raid standards. So while the high level experience remains the same, you should expect the raid team to have a few tricks up their sleeve when you tackle the depths of Venus this summer. I'm still wondering how that's going to work. Now, of course, my natural assumption is there will be a portal that opens somewhere. Maybe it's the 15th Wish in the Dreaming City. Or maybe it'll be a Vex Gate on Europa, much like the one on the moon, and it will open to the Vault of Glass. But, I mean, if they wanted to bring back Venus, like wholesale, that would certainly make season 15 a hell of a season. Now, I don't think that's going to happen. It will likely be a portal opening somewhere. But, you know, I'd like to see Season 15 have some sort of narrative focus around why we're returning to the Vault of Glass. But back to the article. Vault of Glass will also launch with both a contest mode in the first 24 hours and a world's first race. Since this is a reprised raid, we're going to be doing the world's first a bit different. Players looking to claim a belt will not only have to complete the raid, but also a curated list of challenging triumphs. And while only one fire team will walk away with the belt, there are plenty of opportunities for players to earn the ability to purchase some sweet real-world loot through Bungie Rewards. Why are we doing a world's first for Vault of Glass? We kind of already did that, and the point of a world's first is to be the first one to do it. I mean, we've already done the Vault of Glass. And the point of a world's first shouldn't just be the challenge introduced via levels, but the challenge introduced via discovering the mechanics. I'm far less interested in watching a raid team try to world's first a raid we already know, while simultaneously flipping through menus to see what new challenges they have to do for X encounter. Like, I, okay. I mean, I guess celebrate your raids and shit, but like, eh, really, we're doing this? Okay. One last thing. Before the end of the year, we are looking to add a master version of the Vault of Glass. We're really excited about how Master and Grandmaster difficulties have altered Nightfall Strikes, increasing the potency of combat and the importance of executing mechanics. We would like all our future RAD, Raid and Dungeon content to offer Master difficulty versions, where players can earn adept Raid and Dungeon gear. And while we're not able to commit to a Season 14 timeframe for Master Vog, we do want to take the time to develop sustainable structure that allows us to ship these closer together in future releases. Sounds great, but I'd also suggest implementing spoils of conquest in more activities. I mean, think about it. You're running a raid. You love to play the Deepstone Crypt, but you've gotten everything out of the Deepstone Crypt that you want. And now you just have spoils of conquest sitting in your inventory, taking up space. Why not retroactively add chests like the Deepstone Crypt chest to The Last Wish? Or allow players to spend their spoils of conquest at the end of Nightfall Strikes to open up a chest that guarantees a drop from the Nightfall specific loot pool, getting reacquainted with Adelaide. In Season 14, Ada 1 is returning to the tower, and with her comes the ability for players to take any armor they have in their collections and turn it into a universal ornament. In Destiny 2, we will call this transmog system Armor Synthesis. 
Every season, Ada will offer players a set of bounties that highlight various activity types. Players can complete these quests and receive the materials they need to power up Ada's loom, which can turn any piece of armor in your collection into a permanent universal ornament. Players short on time will also be able to purchase synthesis tokens for silver. Yeah, see, I've been saying that's exactly what they were going to do since they announced Transmog. And I, of course, can see growing pains with this. Currently, sets of armor are priced at around $15 in the cash shop. That would be a little ludicrous for something that I own and that, in many respects, I'm unable to use because of sunsetting. Even at $10, we're seeing a price point that is a little overbearing. That is, however, entirely dependent on just how hard these materials are to grind out. If it takes an afternoon to grind out a set of armor and it's $15 in the cash shop, well, why are you paying for it? spend an afternoon. If it takes a week or two to grind these things out, and it's $15 in the cash shop, the balance has been skewed in favor of the cash shop. This also applies if the seasonal bounties are only enough to get you one or two sets of armor. Again, people are going to lose their shit. But we continue. Once you've acquired some new universal ornaments, you will want to head over to the new appearance screen in your character menu, where you can manage the ornaments on all your gear in one place. You'll also find that you can apply shaders here individually or on all pieces of your equipped gear with one click. To make it even easier to try out a bunch of new looks in Season 14, we've also changed shaders to be permanent unlocks, meaning you no longer need to hold on to stacks of shaders in your inventory. The shader changes are amazing and they are much needed changes, one that I never quite understood why we didn't have to begin with. You know, because there's already a shader menu in the game. Why doesn't this menu just come up when you're applying shaders? I have no clue, but they're fixing it. So now I just hope that you can tag your favorite shaders and they will be placed ahead of the hundreds of shaders that exist in the game. At the beginning of season 14, we will be including a starting supply of synthesis materials as a reward for completing the seasonal onboarding quest. We know many of you have been looking forward to synthesis for a long time, and we want to front load your ability to create some of the looks you've been looking forward to showing off. That's nice of them, but I do wonder if that'll be account bound, because if it's not account bound, I can just keep creating new characters and get synthesis materials. It'll probably be account bound. And last, but certainly not least, Combined Fire. Crossplay is coming to the masses in Season 15. We'll be doing some internal rollouts and alpha tests in Season 14 to prepare for the widespread launch this fall. With Crossplay, you'll be able to play with all your friends no matter what platform you call home. And don't worry, we won't be matching console players and PC players together in the Crucible unless PC players specifically invite their console friends to play with them in their PC Crucible pools. This is another great piece of information. There was a little bit of worry after the last set of updates that tried to bring PC more in line with console, that crossplay would just be one large clusterfuck. It's good to see that it's not, and that it's entirely opt-in. Some of you have noticed that Ikora Ray has not been nearly as present recently in Destiny 2. We've missed her as well. Not only will you be seeing Ikora again in Season 14, she will be playing a pivotal role in Witch Queen. That's cool, I always thought it was a little odd that during Season of the Hunt, Sagira dies and like, Ikora is nowhere to be found. <laughs> It's like, oh, your friend and mentor's ghost just got killed and um, where exactly are you? I believe there's some lore or web lore stuff about it, I don't remember which one, but that's not in game. I want to see stuff in the game, the thing that I play. I want to hear fucking characters interact and like see them interact and like do things and I love the lore but goddamn Bungie sometimes you use it as a crutch. Anyways, more Ikora is always a cool thing. In Beyond Light, we introduce stasis subclasses. Like Solar, Arc, and Void, stasis will continue to evolve into a fully supported damage type. In Season 15, we will introduce our first round of legendary stasis energy and power weapons. There will be a lot more info here as we get closer to fall. That's super interesting because with new damage types should come new enemy typings as well. More recently in Season 13, we rolled out Phase 1 of our new Gilded Title system, where players can gild our ritual titles like Conqueror, Unbroken, Dredgen, and Flawless each season. In Season 14, Phase 2 of Gilding Titles will roll out. When players gild a title, it will now display how many times that title has been gilded in the past. That's cool if you care about that sort of thing. I, I don't. I've never been one into the titles, so... Cool. <laughs> I mean, like, hey, quality of life. If you like that sort of thing, it gives you more pursuits. I'm not gonna bash it. It's just, uh, you know what? I'm the least excited thing in this update. I don't care about gilding, so... I apologize. Sorry, not sorry. 
Anyways, yeah, that was a lot of that. Now, of course, I am cautiously optimistic. How many times has Bungie promised this, that, and the other, a renewed focus on PvP, or to respect player time and investment, or to do this, that, and the other, and um, either not do it or implement it half-ass? That said, it is only fair because this is new management to wait and see. Then, criticize or praise on what's actually delivered or what they failed to deliver. Everything here is a step in the right direction. However, historically, Destiny has a problem of taking a step in the right direction, then taking two steps back, and it's been doing it for the entirety of its lifespan. That said, for the first time in a long time, I am actually hopeful for the future of Destiny. But hey, those are just my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. Remember to like, but only if you did. Subscribe for more. Feel free to donate to my Patreon if you're feeling particularly generous. But above all else, stay frosty.